Forbes India, Tycoons of Tomorrow, presented by Neon. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the second edition of Forbes India Tycoons of Tomorrow, presented by Neom, powered by Reliance Industries, driving partner Volkswagen India, banking partner HSBC, health partner B1, associate partner Commerzify, in association with CNBC TV 18. I'm Sumera Abdi, and it's so good to be back uh, to a packed house once again to celebrate the Forbes India tycoons of tomorrow. So let's get down to it. What comes to your mind when you think of the word tycoon? A person of wealth and power, maybe? Well, somebody typically from business and industry, am I right? Well, wealth and power may be one of the pillars that define a tycoon, but dedication, excellence, and a relentless pursuit of success make the foundation strong. These qualities then open up a gamut of professionals to recognize, from sportspersons to actors who also make up the 2021-22 Forbes India Tycoons of Tomorrow list. These tycoons have achieved major milestones in their journey, but they are far from done. To bring this evening to order, may I welcome Brian Carvalho, editor of Forbes India, to deliver the welcome address. Thank you, Samira, and a big welcome to all present here for Forbes India's second edition of the Tycoons of Tomorrow. I'll take off from where Sumaira left, this word tycoon. What are we trying to signify with it? I remember when we were working on the inaugural Tycoons of Tomorrow list in 2018, there was considerable debate within the team over the use of the word tycoon. The case for it? Well, we are Forbes India, we write about wealth creators and billionaires, so tycoon is perfect. The case against it was that its usage would leave out the non-business folk, actors, entertainers, sportspersons, not all who will go on to acquire huge wealth and power, but are still winners. Why not something like icons or heroes of tomorrow instead? We eventually, of course, went with tycoons of tomorrow with one clear thought. Our tycoons are not just about wealth and power. They are those who are pushing the boundaries of creativity and performance. Wealth creation is, after all, a byproduct of performance. Before the riches comes performance, whether you're a startup founder or an actor or a sportsperson. Let me give you an example of one of our tycoons of tomorrow who is not from the world of business. Aditi Ashok, India's great golfing hope. Now, Aditi was pretty much an unknown entity in many parts of the country till the Tokyo Olympics. For those who do follow golf, Aditi would have, would have at best been a gallant qualifier. Expectations would have been minimal from somebody ranked 200 in the world. What happened next? Aditi finished fourth, missing a medal by a whisker. The bigger picture, though, is still bright for Aditi, who was just 23 then. She's got a long road ahead on which there will be victories, as well as a few inevitable disappointments. Aditi Ashok in our book is a potential tycoon, a tycoon of tomorrow. Like Aditi, our tycoons of tomorrow listies have passed several milestones, and there will be many more to come. Not all will make it, but that's OK. Turning tycoon may be the destination, but the, ful but the fulfillment could often come in the journey. We're here to, today to felicitate some of these superstars of tomorrow. In between those felicitations, the Forbes India team has also put together some scintillating sessions that promise to entertain and inform. So sit back and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. 
Well, with that, let's uh, get to our first session this evening. I'd like to call on stage an actor par excellence, but that's not her only identity. An entrepreneur, an investor, and now a producer and a mom-to-be. Her recently released film, Bharmastra, is making waves at the box office, and that comes close on the heels of her production debut, Darlings. Please put your hands together for Alia Bhatt. And let me and let me also invite on stage Mangala Malu, my colleague, assistant editor, and senior anchor at CNBC TV 18, to moderate this session. Wow! Just a huge round of applause once again for her. And the reason why I say that is because, uh, you know, mouthing Sumera's words once again. You're an actor, an entrepreneur, an investor, a brand ambassador, occasional singer, and soon mom-to-be. Man, how do, you, how do you manage to get the time for all of this, and how do you find, find the balance? Who's saying I'm balanced? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think everything uh, that you do with love, just sort of um, takes away all the focus from what's not working to what's working. And uh, it keeps you driven, it keeps you focused, and it keeps you uh, satiated, which is, I think, the main purpose, right, in life. Like, you, you come on Earth and, okay, now you have to live this life, so what do you do? <laughs> you know, keep yourself hungry and um, then feed your soul and uh, while away the time until it's time to say goodbye. Wow, that's a rather, rather spiritual, Alia. Uh, I'm quite a spiritual person. Yeah. Well, that's another tag added to all the things that you achieve. But, you know, because it's Forbes and because we're talking about your investment journey, etc. I just wanted to know, you, from, from the time you grew up to now, uh, or rather growing up to now, uh, what has your relationship with money been like? And now that you have a lot of it, by the way, Duff and Phelps estimates her value, brand value, to be $68.1 million. That's number fourth on that list. Uh, uh, so what's your relationship with money been like and uh, how involved are you? Well, when I was, in, when I was younger, of course, my relationship with, with money was re uh, restricted to the pocket money that I received from my mom and which I um, would um, very carefully um, uh, save up and then spend on some uh, s strange items. I remember once we went to London and we had only 200 pounds for the whole trip to shop. And I went and I spent 170 pounds in the first um, outing because it was the first time I was going into such a large um, sort of shopping space with like so many brands. So I had no understanding of it. Even now, my mom handles my money. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how much money I even have in my bank, to be very honest. But every now and then I, s of course, sit with my team and they take me through the numbers. Um, and I have a certain idea and a certain sense, but I know that my mother right now is handling my money very well. So my relationship with the money is to make it and then have my mother handle it. How, how close is it, is it to the Duffin Phelps number, $68 million? I don't kiss and tell. I don't, I don't <laughs> earn and sleep. No, no, just kidding. Uh, so, uh, you know, when, when, you, uh, when you meet your team, what, what is the brief that you give to them with regards to the financial decisions that they make for you? You mean with regards to my investments? Yes. So, I do not invest in businesses or stories that I don't understand. I think for me, I in, the idea of investment is investing in a story, investing in a person, investing in a vision, something that I connect with, something that makes sense to me. Um, you, let's take pool, for example. Yeah. You know, um, they're contributing to reducing waste in the country and also giving 100 women jobs on a daily basis. So I love that story. Investing in Nika, of course, was a no-brainer, but it was the story about it being founded by a woman um, you know, it, the, 
the fact that India is now at that global platform doing what we do best, competing with the world that at its best. So it's for me the story and the vision that I connect with, that I understand, that's where my investments lie. And uh, I have to ask you this, what came first, the idea of a children's wear brand or the name Edamama? Because it's the cutest name I've heard in my life. So actually, the way Edamama happened was a byproduct of, actually, we were having a conversation of me starting out um, a clothing line of my own. Mm -hmm. And I was really thinking about it and I was like, listen, I am not sure whether people really care about, like, they'll come and watch my movies, but just because I'm starting a clothing line doesn't mean they're going to come and buy it. So I just asked the team to do a bit of research and said, okay, let's find out, find the gap in the market. And turns out there was a genuine gap for a, you know, a strong, homegrown Indian kids wear clothing brand. And then I was okay, fine, why don't we explore that? Of course, I had no idea about how much of a gap it was, but when the process began of, of, of researching and developing and putting that together, it was an eye-opener. And then came the, the brand name Edomama, and it's an interesting story because my cat's name is Edward. Okay. And I was like, okay, I'm his mama, so Edamama. And at the end of the day, mothers are the ones that shop for their babies most of the time. Fathers do as well, I'm sure. But so it was like Ed a mama, I am Ed's mama. And I was also working on like a children's storybook at that time of this young girl and her dog who go on these adventures. It was my way of sort of, um, you know, nurturing a love in children for nature. Because that's something that I feel very passionate about, our environment, you know, the, you know the, the, the awareness that we should have as people living on this planet and a responsibility that we should bring to the table. And the best way to kind of cultivate that for the future is to instill those habits and that interest in a child. So it started off with a storytelling book and then I just kind of merged that idea with the kids wear brand and then came Edamama. You said that mothers are the ones who usually shop the most for their children. Is that going to be the case later as well? Well, actually, that was the wrong thing for me to say because <laughs> it's also kind of sexist because I, I think fathers shop as well. Uh, but uh, <laughs> and, uh, even in my case, I've done a bit of shopping and so has my husband. Um, but yeah, I think because I'm the mama, I was like Edda mama, you know, so put me in there somewhere. Uh, I, I take that point. Have, have you guys decided on who's going to share uh, the responsibilities uh, and what responsibilities come whose way? I think the journey of discovery will begin once the baby comes. Um, but definitely the intention is to share. That's most important. And um, Ranbir is very happy. Like he's already been like, you know, like maybe you work from like from from whatever this month onwards I'll take time off so you can go to work and then I can come back and then you can take time off and then we just keep taking time off and he's very happy to share that responsibility and he in fact recently said in an interview that I think I have a very big responsibility on my head and that is to send Alia back to work because the <laughs> movies would really complain and hold me responsible if I don't do my bit as the parent as well. I completely so, yeah. agree with you not only the movies uh, uh, will uh, you know be poorer if your presence isn't there immediately, the audience will want a lot more content from you coming by as well. And at this point, I'd like you guys to actually give a huge round of applause for Alia's philosophy, so to, uh, so to say, because she was uh, talking about the business, the numbers, etc. And she constantly mentioned about her mother handling her uh, finances and her research team finding gaps, etc. for her. And what that means is that she focuses on her strengths and lets the others do, you know, what they're good at. That's, that's perfect teamwork. And, you know, that brings me to the question about endorsements, etc. How do you decide what brand to take on? Is it just the money? Is it the philosophy? Have you ever said no to brands that offered a lot of money? It's the values. It has to make sense. You know, it has to, it, it has to match. Like, at the end of the day, I will not wear an outfit also that I feel is not going with my personality. So why would I endorse a brand that I don't believe in or that I don't feel like, okay, I would be make sense um, being the face of. Um, so yeah, I think it's, 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 it, has to be, it has to be a relationship that works both ways. If the brand believes in me, I need to believe in the brand. And that's the only way an authentic collaboration is possible. And if it's not authentic, people smell it. And then, you know, then it just kind of 
kind of goes down the drain. So there's there's no point if it, you don't actually see a, a fit there. Are there brands that you would not, uh, uh, not brands, I would say, are there categories that you would never endorse? Never say never, but I mean, you would avoid endorsing? I'm sure. Well, what would they be? They are for me to know and you to find out. <laughs> okay. Uh, then what brought you into production? I mean, what was, what was the thought behind producing content? Well, it started off with a film like Darlings that came to me. Uh, a phenomenal film, by the way. I'm sorry you. to interrupt you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And what started off is like a, maybe like a bit of a mathematical calculation, being like, okay, I wouldn't want to loan, load the production of the film, so I'll charge a lesser fee, and I'll take a back end on the film, and etc., etc., and all of that. But actually, what I realized by that time was that I was getting way more interested in what happens behind the camera and what it takes to make a movie. Ten years into the industry, I've had my first film as a producer out and I feel even now the understanding that I have ga gathered on making a film like Darlings has been so substantial and I'm always learning. That's something, that's my motto, always continuously learn, continuously grow, always ask the questions because you don't have all the answers. No one has all the answers, even Bill Gates doesn't have the answers. That's exactly why I said you guys should clap. <laughs> always learning, always asking questions, always delegating it to the experts. So I, uh, you don't have to all constantly make them forcefully clap for me if they don't really feel like clapping for me. <laughs> well, I mean, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So I think that's where it came from that, okay, yes, this is seeming financially the right thing to do, but it's also seeming the right thing to do for me as a creative individual 10 years into the industry. I mean, at that time it was eight years, but still. And then began the process and it's something that I've had such a lovely fun experience doing and now the endeavor is to, I'm still a boutique production house, it's not like I'm going to be churning out content, but I will set out a certain um, goal, like okay, I would you know, like to develop a show, a movie, a podcast, a, whatever it is, I want to put out content that I think um, connects, has an emotional core, um, which is extremely high and um, yeah, and, and, and I want to be a part of the filmmaking process behind the camera and not just in front of the camera. That always makes you a better artist in front of the camera as well, if you know what's going on behind it. Uh, final, uh, you know, business related question, so to say, what are the future plans? I mean, you've invested in Fulco, there is Edamama, there are all the other investments that you have, etc. Is there any particular category that you're looking at? Uh, I think what I'll continue to do is look for the gaps and try and fill them. Like as simple as today, I launched um, uh, mother care, uh, 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 mother uh, maternity. Maternity. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. So exactly, what started off as a gap in my wardrobe turned out to be a whole maternity line. And in fact, even today, I'm wearing my own maternity line because these are really comfy lounge pants. <laughs> okay, they're really comfy. What's the brand? Edamama. Okay. Maternity wear. So this is like my lounge pant and like a lounge set, but. The lounge layer was not making any sense. It was looking like I was coming to lounge at the Forbes event. So I paired it up with this blazer, which is not mine. Okay. But basically, that's what I discovered is that the maternity wear, which, which I was seeing, was just all... It had a certain style, which was just like screaming maternity. I was like, okay, I want to bring my own style into it, which is what I did. So that has been one of the exciting things. Uh, just out of curiosity, have you dabbled in sneaker investing? Because I see Aman out here, he's wearing Travis uh, Fragment Lows. I've pulled out my heats for I you. I think that's Ranbir something my is, husband yeah. will be very good at. I don't understand sneakers. H how many pairs does he have? I think about 50. That's it? I or maybe 150, more. I'm not sure. I, I try not to look at his shoe wardrobe. <laughs> it gives me anxiety. I know that. <laughs> so. Uh, Final questions, a set of questions. We call it the quick fire questions because it is the season. And no, I'm not going to ask you to rate actors in order of preference, etc., whatever. A financial decision that you're extremely proud of. Edamama. Mama. It's my own money. Your biggest loss making financial decision. Excuse me? My biggest loss making financial decision. Or your decision? worst financial decision. Let's put it that way. I say no such thing for now. Wow, that's 100% success rate. And uh, a, a financial mistake you would advise people entering, uh, you know, uh, the field of acting or your uh, uh, profession, you would ask them to avoid something that you learned much earlier. 
don't undervalue yourself but also don't overvalue yourself between ranveer and you who saves more money both of us are very good we um we're good we don't spend that much money to be very honest and uh, your share expenses on a house and th the final question this one is basically uh, my own which is um, from the four films of yours which i love the music of among all the others there is uh, mahi way from highway there is mai tenu samjhawa there is bolna from um, kapoor and sons and there is kesariya which is the one which you're going to sing today <laughs> do i have to sing it's a forbes event come on okay i'll sing kesariya since that just is the film that just released all right and it's still in the theaters yes kesariya tera ishq hai piya rang jaau jo main haath lagaau din beete sara teri fikr mein rehn sari teri khair manaau that ladies and gentlemen was alia bhat thank you so much just uh, stay back here cuz sumera comes back to give you a big big award Can you guys hear me? Thank you so much, Alia. Thanks, Mangalam. Uh, let me invite uh, Preeti Sahni, CEO of Forbes India, to come on stage and present Alia Bhatt with the recognition of the Forbes India Icon of Excellence. Alia Preeti Mangalam thank you very much thank you very much thank you thank you and with that uh, we move to the first panel discussion this evening so india has a 100 plus strong unicorn club with most of the 1 billion uh, dollar valuations coming in 2021 there are however but a handful of profitable unicorns as the summery funding season has given way to a funding winter the strength of business models resilience of the business and strategy of co-founders are at the forefront please join me in welcoming the co-founders of two profitable unicorns varun and ghazal alag of mama earth and aditya sharda and sovik sen gupta of infra dot market to talk about We'll be talking about the need for more profitable unicorns in India. Let me also invite my colleague Shruti Mishra, Deputy Editor, CNBC TV 18, to moderate this event. Please have a seat. Good evening ladies and gentlemen and like Sumaira said we are here I have with me two profitable unicorns uh, we've got Mama Earth and we've got Infra Market uh, many thanks panelists for joining us here and now you know let's discuss the merits of profits over valuations and how to build long lasting businesses um, in fact like you know sumara mentioned in her intro uh, india has a 100 plus strong unicorn club and an equal number of uh, unicorns uh, you know waiting to line up number of startups waiting there to line up uh, also however there is a big but and that is we have a handful number of unicorns that are profitable I want to ask you, you know, Varun. Let me start with you. Uh, the VCs, private equity players, investors are all moving away. They're not just focusing on valuations. The focus is more on corporate governance, strong fundamentals, generating strong cash flows. You know, you've been frugal since the very beginning at Mama Earth, and I want to understand how important than ever today is the need for strong fundamentals to strong uh, to generate strong cash flows. Hey, firstly, thank you for having us here, and hi, hello, everyone. Um, the need has always been there, and will continue to be there. I mean, anything in this world, be it business, be it relationships, nothing can be really sustainable if it doesn't have fundamentals. Absolutely. And, uh, and hence, the the shift from a little bit of craziness to 
fundamentals is, is a great shift, right? Mm -hmm. Because finally, first principles is how anything gets created. And, and um, uh, that, in my mind, but it's not, it's not necessary that all businesses need to make profit in year one or year five. Mm -hmm. and every business has its own journey. And as long as the fundamentals are right, and the vision is there, and, and frugality is there in the DNA. And, I mean, look at Amazon today, one of the most valuable companies that exists on the globe. Right? Mm. Till about five years back, it was unprofitable. Right? And that was 20 years into its journey. Mm. And still, when they were fourth year into their existence, and all their tables were made out of doors of IKEA. Right? Uh, they did not buy proper tables. Right? They bought doors from IKEA, and hence every table had a small hole in them. Mm. And that's frugality. Absolutely. And the culture existed, right? mm. but they were building something which was far bigger, and, mm. and hence on a journey which they shared with their investors, right? mm. and they were public, right? mm. and still the market sort of went with them. Right? So everybody has their own journey. And, uh, looking down on um, losses in the short term might not help you create world-changing companies in the long term, like Tesla, etc. Mm. Uh, but fundamentals, I agree, have to be in place. All right, fundamentals, fundamentals have to be in place. Uh, we all completely believe in the power of the balance sheet, but let me quickly move on to infra market. You know, yours is a B2B company, and of course, you've got business to retail. And the general view is that, you know, uh, while B2C and commerce companies turn profitable in about, you know, seven to eight years of time, it's perhaps a little easier for B2B ventures. And I believe you've, you've never uh, posted losses. You've been profitable. I want to know how, and also especially what should founders focus now on? There's a stronger scrutiny, there's stronger accountability. What should founders focus on? Um, I think, uh, like you said, B2B companies have different unit economics to B2C companies. And like, you know, carrying on from Varun said that, I think sensitivity to profitability is very critical. Hmm. I don't think it's about a number that you are profitable or not profitable. How many, how many rupee value profit, how much rupee value profit are you making? I don't think that really carries much importance from investors' point of view or stakeholders' point of view. I think the fact remains that if you can foresee when you will become profitable, what is your path to profitability, that's critical. Okay. From, but as a B2B company, I think it's very critical to understand that what you're building will require more capital than B2C companies. Essentially because you're attacking a problem where there are a lot of large incumbents that eventually yes. you're going to have to take on, right? And you're going to have to disrupt the market which technically is scale, has much more scale than B2C companies because you're effectively trying to you know, disrupt large industries compared to a B2C company. And when you have such large pools of capital that you require, you can't only depend on venture capital investors. Oh. And to tap different pools of capital, you need to have a business model that, that actually convinces these different pools of capital to come and invest in you. That could be debt capital, that could be private markets, that could be private credit markets, banks. And obviously you can't tap onto those players if you're actually loss making. So I think inherently at a, as a B2B company to survive, if you're going to only survive on equity capital, you're going to run a very inefficient model. And you're going to run a very capital intensive model that's not going to play out in the long run. So I think that depends on the model. Like, you know, if you're running a B2C company, you can afford losses because there's a path to what Amazon has done, okay. but a B2B company can't really. So I think that depends on the model you're running. For example, if you're running a deep tech company, you can't be profitable for next four years. Absolutely, five, right? yes. But, yeah. So, all right. So, while profitability certainly goes a long way in building, uh, you know, long-lasting businesses, I recently spoke to Kanwaljeet Singh of Fireside Ventures, who's also your investor, and uh, he pointed out that, you know, at Mama Earth, you guys have done a fabulous job where you've actually retained quite a bit of equity to yourselves, and it's not just the investors and the company that's making profits, but also the founders, which is kind of rare now. I want to understand, Gazal, from you, how are you making long-lasting businesses? You know, uh, what has been your focus? focus at Mama Earth that you've made profits for the company, for your investors, and for yourself? I think the... Sorry. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, I think from the very beginning, the only way that we understood to make a business was eventually have a clear vision of how it will start making money for us, as well as people who have put their trust in us. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was always the core. And I think... Because we were so cognizant of that, I think year on year, the, the focus on the p &L was very, very strong. And um, we started, um, you know, with a vision saying there are going to be initial few years where, where you know, we'll, we'll be investing a lot more because we are building a brand. Hmm. 
and that's required, right? Brand building is a very difficult exercise. You need to get to the right consumers. You need to explain what you're creating. And hence, that's the growth stage where we'll probably burn and that's okay. But then there needs to come a point and we need to identify that point where we'll say that, okay, now the business needs to grow sustainably hmm. and eventually then get to profitability. So I think that path was really clear in our minds. That's what we have followed. That's what we are following with our newer brands, which are next to Mama Earth as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, that did help. <laughs> All right. I you would know, add to yes, this. Please. I would say just uh, take some money from your friends and relatives. And, uh, really helps because you become very careful with that money. You, you know you want to return that yeah. to maintain relationships, which is what we had done earlier. Yes, and you've been very frugal. I have to, you know, say this because you never spent on lavish offices, never hired top guns, uh, you know, not those big uh, money uh, placements. And also, uh, most importantly, I believe you only started marketing and aggressively marketing our brand, especially on TV, what, in 2020? Uh, you know, uh, before that, we didn't see much of, you know, much spends on marketing and branding. And it is quite uh, unique, it sort of speak of, because you're in a D2C business, you know, where, uh, so how did you do that brand building? And, you know, when you have investor money lying in your banks, it's not that you didn't have the money. Uh, what hard choices did you make, Varun? Or Gazal, whoever wants to answer. Uh, no, in fact, I could see Amit smiling because he's, <laughs> he's been to really, really shabby, offices of ours. Yes, right? we've, we've, we've heard were, about that yeah, as well. <laughs> <laughs> which were in like the these corner basements, basement and, <laughs> which was also actually a, a like scrapyard which, which we converted into office. Right? Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think the journey of creating a, a sustainable, profitable business is all about making hard choices. Hmm. Right? And, you know, in fact, uh, we, we, we say this often, but strategy is about what you say no to rather than what you say yes to. Right? Absolutely. Uh, and hence, I believe what we have said no to over time and is what has helped us reach where we have reached, right? I mean, um, saying no to some of these lavish spends that you talked about or saying no to uh, taking up mass advertising before you reach mass distribution hmm. right? because that will actually lead to a wasteful... Uh, spend and, and it'll, it'll uh, spill, right? Hmm. Saying no to aggressive blitz scaling if your supply chain is not capable of supporting uh, that scale. Right? Uh, saying no to um, really fancy hires, not because we believe they will not come and add value, right? but because we believe that the, the, the task at hand right? is actually not large enough for them. Hmm. Right? And um, with a with a large leader, right? it's not just the leader, but their uh, their intent of having a large team yes. and you know the other pieces which they're used to also follows. And you hmm. need hmm. your balance sheet, your PNL needs to be able to support that. Hmm. Right? And also over time, saying no to investors right? um, when you don't really need the money. Right? Yes. Uh, I mean, the, and, and raising just for the heck of it. Right? I think all of those no's has, has gotten us where we are. Yes, and, and that's absolutely worked out for you. And coming back to inframarket and coming back to making hard choices, you know, inframarket was under a lot of scrutiny. And of course, you're not the first guys, uh, first companies or startups to have, uh, you know, GST queries or in IT uh, queries. But I just wanted to know, did the unicorn tag add more pressure? You know, uh, did you feel that, you know, you had investor expectations, you have lo lofty valuations and you had the profitability and everything um, all matching at the same time? So do you think the unicorn tag added to the pressure? Not really. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Not really. I don't think the unicorn tax adds pressure on a day-to-day -day basis or I think it's that event when you become a unicorn or when you get compared. I don't think it's a daily sort of thing. Yes, valuations can add pressure, but I think for more for us, it's about stakeholders. Hmm. The stakeholders who are there, yes. If you have external stakeholders in your company, that will have uh, added pressure for you to eventually uh, explain the situation to all. I think that adds pressure, but I don't think that would add pressure whether you're valued at $100 million or whether you're valued at $3 billion. I don't think that is subject to valuations or that is subject to... I mean, you were the more in the media scrutiny, so to speak, of. Uh, Correct. I think that is because you are a startup. I think what happens is that startups get... Uh, so if you if you want all the accolades, you have to take the break back sort of a thing. Hmm. So hmm. you get all the... So when you raise any money or you do anything good, you get all the media releases. So 
You get it also when something bad happens. I think that's part of the part okay. of the journey. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I think exactly. Um, I think you guys love us a lot. Right? Like <laughs> we do. all of us. Yeah. Yes. So, so if you see, uh, unicorn by concept is imaginary, right? Unrealistic, unconventional. So I think anything which is unrealistic and unconventional, people generally happen to look at it under a microscope. Hmm. Okay, hey, what's happening, right? So there was a time when, uh, the 2021, uh, there was enough equity to spoil the market, right? There were, there, the valuations were soaring. Uh, there was a lot of dry powder in the ecosystem because for almost a year there was no investments happening. Right? Yes. So the money was chasing the ideas. So at that time, the kind of valuation spurt up happened. I think that got us, not us, but a many institutions, many businesses, a lot of attention. And as you get the good part, as Shavik said, right? So if there is any of such news, like I do remember, uh, there were about 93 news articles on us, right? 93, we still, as in one of my team members still has got that. Uh, okay. Uh, that the, we, have, we have kept it, right? And. I think uh, in B2B businesses, see, we, we, are a, we are a young company developing with our processes, uh, understanding compliances and everything. And, and we have to understand that a lot of business happened during the COVID period, right? Mm -hmm. Where the processes were not involved, where there were a lot of uh, the vendors and uh, the supplies happening uh, uh, without we working online, uh, without we working physically. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So I think what happens is that during that time, uh, even if there was lapses, like the, by the time you correct it, okay. right, you're already okay. under the uh, the microscope. And in India, I think it does happen. Like many of the business houses have come under mm -hmm. uh, tax department scrutiny. But I think the kind of attention, not only us and even in coming time, any of the unicorns would enjoy. But would be slightly more. I, I do remember during the same time there was Hirandani's, there were Hero Motors, a couple of large institutions. But I mm -hmm. think we were the favorite ones. Okay, right. you are the favorite ones, and I also want to understand what kind of uh, conversations are you having with your investors right now, you know? Uh, what has changed? Uh, like he spoke about, there was a spurt in valuations. Now, VC is everybody is realizing course corrections, everyone's realizing profits. I mean, of course, you've been profitable. Uh, but what kind, what has changed? What has changed in the conversation? No, I think uh, what has changed in the conversations is that most, start, most investors today, see, investing for them, what I think, what you as a startup founder you have to realize is that you are a portfolio of one. Mm -hmm. You as a startup founder have only one company you can look up to. As an investor, they can have 100 and they can have a hit rate and they can decide, okay, five out of these 100 make money, that's good enough for them. You mm -hmm. have only one. Yes. Yeah, you don't have that luxury, right? So you are not, irrespective of lofty valuations in 2021 or of funding winter in 2022, you have to align yourself to building what you are building because you don't have those you don't have a hit rate of 5 to 10%. You have, a, you have to have a hit rate of 100% to survive. So I think for us, not much has changed in day to day. Okay. Investors, yes, they have gone out. Some of them who were very aggressive are no longer aggressive. But I know there are obviously other pools of capital you can tap into. And they will want the day. We will, we will, at the benefit of a profitable startup is you can raise when you want hmm. to when the markets are good and not need to raise every day. Uh, I think, I think uh, generally the appreciation of being profitable has increased, hmm. right? So I do remember, you know, we were, we were bootstrapped for three years uh, from 2017 until 2019. And we couldn't raise capital because every investor said, why do, why do you need capital? You can go to the banks and raise it, right? And at some point we used to think that, uh, like, is it, a, is it a crime? that as a, Is it a mistake that we are being profitable, right? <laughs> so we have been through that journey. But okay. yes, now I think the appreciation of being profitable, the appreciation of concentrating on unit economics hmm. uh, has started making more sense. And generally, the, because it's on the ecosystem, Right. So I think it gets a lot of pressure and the best ones will win. All right. right. So the best ones will win. Companies that have strong fundamentals will have no dearth of capital is what you're trying to say. Again, you know, the rules of the game have changed. Uh, the way consumers interact with brands today has changed. We all know about the big Bharat opportunity that is there. If you could elaborate on how you're, uh, you know, planning to tap into this big market, you know, you're already aggressive on, uh, you've started uh, very aggressively expanding on offline stores as well. But will you be looking at the Bharat opportunity as well? I think we are already looking at the Bharat mm -hmm. of today, for that matter. Um, you know, uh, around 40% of 40 to 50% of our business comes from there. So mm -hmm. it's a very, very critical market for us. Um, the, the consumers are evolving, their needs are evolving. Uh, the concept around individualism, where a consumer wants products for him rather than for the whole family, the way it used to be earlier, mm -hmm. that shift is changing. 
And because of that, uh, you know, sometimes we feel that the definition of tier two, tier three might not be as strong, but uh, these, these cities now have consumers who have the ability to pay. You know, Bharat is changing and we need to all listen to that. And the most important thing, right, um, at least reaching out directly to, the, to these consumers, uh, we've realized that there are no geographical boundaries the way they used to be earlier, Absolutely. right? At least through online, you can reach to Thanks every to, yeah. consumer, be it India, be it Bharat, deliver them your products if they are looking for one. Uh, and since that system has evolved so much, there is no reason why one shouldn't be looking at that. All right, okay. I also want to talk to you about uh, your house of brand strategy. You know, you've acquired three companies. You've got an army of your own. You've got the Derma company. You've got uh, Aqualogica and Ayug. If you could elaborate on, because, you know, a lot of brands are doing that, uh, you know, this creating this whole house of brand strategy. What is unique about yours? Ours works. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, it's, it's, it's not a new strategy, mm. right? I mean... If you look at Unilever, L'Oreal, yeah, yeah. right, any of these companies, a lot of startups right, are now also doing that. Um, yeah, this is a this is a this is a basic strategy of using your corporate strength right, to actually get a higher wallet share of the consumer that you're targeting. Right. Uh, our core market is India. Right. India's consumer has diverse interests. Right. There might be a consumer who wants a natural product. There might be a consumer who wants a scientific skincare product, which is active-based. There's a consumer who wants a sallow-like hair care. On the other hand, there is a consumer who wants long-lasting makeup and does not care about naturals. Right? Now, this is the Indian consumer. And, and we want to make sure that we become the largest beauty and personal care company in India. And if I want to do that, and I have to provide different propositions at different price points to these consumers. Right? And there genuinely has been dearth of brand builders and creators in the market. Yeah. And we would like to be uh, the one who fills the gap. All right, okay. I want to talk to you about uh, the cross-border opportunity, the expansion plans, if you could elaborate on what the future focus is right now. So I think for cross-border opportunity, I think it's an it's a opportunity almost every manufacturing company in India is sitting on. And as we as a contract manufacturing startup are at the cusp of sort of unlocking it, I think we've had PLI schemes launched across sectors. Uh, there's going to be a chi China plus one strategy. That plus now as India, whether we grab that opportunity or that how much of that opportunity goes to other countries, is that actually is the pie is going to increase for India. It's the question is how much of it is going to increase. Mm -hmm. The energy crisis globally, yes. the, the way the prices have stocked up. So I think we are sitting on a cusp of opportunity and we are creating, we have created that platform where contract manufacturers in India can service global clients. Today a large part of our revenue flows from, uh, flows from exports. Uh, we are enabling a lot of manufacturers in India to export globally. So for us, the opportunity is large for us to actually go out there and take India, Indian products and service global requirements. At the same time for us, what is very critical for us to understand is we are really working with what you would call Bharat, where we are actually working with a driver who's driving a truck every day yes. to a labor operator who's ma manning a machine. And we need to build, a, we are, what we are trying to build is a platform that makes their lives easier. So we are not here servicing only, we're not here to service only the creamy layer of the consumers. When you and I walk out here and we see a coastal road getting built, we see a bridge getting built and a road getting built, we are servicing that driver who's getting that material there, we are making their lives easier and we are really proud not only to take their efforts and take those products and take them global, but to actually really be part of building India. I think that is what we as a startup really want to focus on. We want to really be part of this, you know, building India into what it needs to be over the next couple of decades. All right. There are lots, lots of plans, but I want to understand there's a lot of push from the government, uh, lots of things happening in the ecosystem. We've all uh, witnessing the startup growth story, but what more needs to be done? Are we quite there? I think, see, if you ask me, are we quite there? We are not. I think there's a, obviously a continuous room for improvement, right? So uh, we're not there at any point of time. We'll not be there. But yes, today we are, we have got the right policy making. We've got the right element of stability to compete, to attract capital, even in these situations, to enable, today, if 
a lot of founders today are still getting capital for building their businesses. That's completely different from the global scenario. Hmm. We are macroeconomically level, at least much better off than many countries right now, hmm. the way they are operating. So I think, yes, a government has done a lot. The government is, even at our infra level, if you look at it, there's a huge push in, because India is infra deficient, there's a huge push in building that up. So I think the government is doing a lot. Obviously, we are not there. You know, we're not the perfect position yet. We're not in the perfect country, obviously. But the fact remains that there are incremental improvements happening. And I think we're in the right track to sort of build it up. And the, every time we discuss policy level with anyone, we understand mm. that there is an overall thought process to build it up. I mean, I think what they have done with f banks and, and, you know, NPCI and UPI is extraordinarily it's helped starters, right? So, so, I mean, that's a small step. But for us, maybe it's a small thing at the B2B, but even B2C, D2C companies. So, what is your big demand? Like you said, uh, you know, there are improvements. I think exports. I think okay. We need, we really need to enable manufacturers in India to export. If you look at other countries, the way from financing point of view to insurance point of view, the way they have that stack built to enable in their local manufacturers to export globally is phenomenal. And if we want to grab that opportunity, you just need to look at the percentage of exports to a GDP of Vietnam, compare that to India yes. and you'll see that we are still lacking far behind that. We are doing things, but I think that we still need to do a lot for us to be up there and actually be a beneficiary of this China Plus One strategy. Okay, that's, that's the B2B demand. What about you guys, D2C? Where do you think we're lacking? What is the big wish list? Uh, you know, what's, what's not happening? Where are we stuck? No, I, I wouldn't say what's not happening. I think we've moved a fair bit, right, in the last couple of decades. And, uh, but if there was one thing that I would say we need to keep doing and need to keep doing even better is impetus on the economic growth. Right? It would be a combination of a lot of things right? uh, from ensuring we become the plus one production hub, which is going to generate a lot more jobs, and that's another thing, uh, infrastructure investments, right? the right monetary and fiscal policies. Right? Um, I think there, there needs to be a lot of economic activity and a lot of focus on growth for the next, you know, couple of decades. Right? Okay. Uh, we're just poised to win. Right? <laughs> we just need to ensure we don't, we don't lose the game ourselves. All right. We're poised to win and, you know, you guys are not just founders but investors as well. I want to understand your investment philosophy, what do you look for in a startup, how do you make that bet? I think um, my investment philosophy is very, very simple. Um, I would, I love to bet on people more than ideas to at least begin with because, mm. um, you know, when we started out, our first investor betted on us more than the idea. He said, people are figure out kuch na kuch to kari loge. Okay. And that sort of gave us a lot more confidence, right? That mm. if the people mm. are good, they will build something which is going to give fruit. So, uh, one is that, other than that, I think till the time the idea is solving a large problem within the, um, you know, the, the economy and, and it has been validated that the problem exists and okay. it's there to be solved for, hmm. Hmm. Uh, that's the second thing that I, I look for. All right, so the people and uh, the gap that's there in the market. Also, you know, uh, I want to also talk to you about your omni-channel play, you know. Uh, if you could elaborate on plans on that front, like I mentioned earlier, there's aggressive, uh, you know, offline uh, focus. Uh, what's more in store? What, what's in the pipeline? I think we've, we've always followed the consumer and, and, and we've listened to the consumer. Um, and even our distribution strategy has been in line with that, right? As brands grow, their demand and awareness grows, right? Uh, they need to be available at different points of distribution where the consumer expects you to be, right? uh, which is where we started our offline journey about two years back. Now we're in about 50,000 plus stores, right? Uh, across 200 plus cities, it's not just metro focused because we've honestly always been uh, you know, we, we believed in no racism in geography, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the more we can reach out to the right valuated uh, distribution outlets, that's the, that's the objective, right? And now we've also started opening our own uh, exclusive brand outlets, right? Because uh, what we realized was with the kind of portfolio that Mama Earth has, right? Uh, bringing it to life in a, um, in a multi-brand store might not be possible. Right? So our exclusive brand stores are bringing not just the portfolio to life, but a mm -hmm. purpose like, for example, um, you know, a plastic recycling bin where you can come and submit the bottles or the number of trees that we have planted and how many have that store contributed right? uh, being mentioned there and creating, 
you know, that, that aura of how uh, the, the, the relationship that you just made with us right, made a difference not just to you and your family's health, but also to the community that you live in. So those are some of the things. Okay, all right. I want to hear about your future focus plans and, you know, also one advice that you would give to all B2B founders there or perhaps people who want to enter into the space. So first, your future plans yeah. and then perhaps that one. So I think uh, at Inframarket, uh, we have already started diversifying from a B2B company to retail space. Yeah. Uh, we have already opened our, uh, our franchisee stores, right? And we are looking at scale. Like. So in India, if you see, uh, as you build out your home, right, you typically have to walk into multiple stores. You, you may, for tiles and bath fittings, you may have to move to one store for electrical another, right? So what we are trying to build out is a one, uh, everything under one roof, right? Can you walk in? and give a complete range to your consumer, be it an architect, be, a, be, be it an interior designer, be it a consumer, right? Can, he, can you, as a company, get a larger wallet share of, from your consumer, right? Can you give him a, a, a seamless experience? Can you drive the experience by technology, by digitalizing, right? Okay. So I think for us, retail is the next big thing that we're looking, hmm. right? uh, because as we have, we have already uh, building out the supply chain, so once you have a strong supply chain, it makes sense that from B2B, you start looking at all other networks and start catering for the wider reach. Okay, okay, yeah. that, that, that's good advice and uh, good job that you've done. Before I let you all go, one final question, you know. Uh, you've got uh, over a billion dollar valuation, you've got a swelling top line, a positive bottom line. When do we see you listing? When do we see a profitable unicorn listing? Will it be by end of this year or 2023? Come on, Varun, give us a timeline. So hopefully soon is all hopefully that I can say. Hopefully soon is not a timeline. <laughs> will, will, it, will it be by end of this year? No, it will not okay. be by okay. end of this okay. year. Okay, sure. all right. Listing on the cards? Uh, not, not as fast as you're asking for us, but <laughs> I think listing is just a start of the journey, right? So yes. I think we need a lot of, lot of real fundamentals clear before we list. So I think it's, it's far away from where your, your timelines are, but okay. yes, it's on the cards. Not this year or... Not yes. anytime this year, yeah. Okay, not this year, not next year. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, panelists, for joining us. We've completely run out of time, and many thanks for coming here and joining us. Thank you all for being such a fabulous audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Varun, Ghazal, Aditya, Sovik, uh, Shruti, thank you very much to all of you. We really enjoyed that. And I'm sure there are many lessons that startup founders in this room and in the larger ecosystem as well as executives from conventional businesses can take away from this. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to felicitate our first set of Forbes India tycoons of tomorrow for the year 2021-22. May I invite Ashish Gupta, Brand Director at Volkswagen Passenger Cars India, and Brian Carvalho, Editor Forbes India, to give away the first set of awards. So Kerov and Soumya Engineer are our first tycoons tonight. They're building upon Astral's legacy by foraying into new categories and driving exponential growth for the next decade. Please put your hands together and welcome Kerov Engineer VP Business Development at Astral. Congratulations, Kara. For a next tycoon, exciting is boring. Unicorn status is boring. A staggering spike in revenue that his company boasts of is mundane. Being that rare, profitable unicorn in a sea of red is, well, how you should do business. What tickles Aditya Shada then is the business to retail and private label play he's building with his friend turned co-founder Sovik Sengupta. An eye on the prize is what makes them tycoons of tomorrow. 
please join me in welcoming on stage once again the co-founders of Infra.Market, Aditya Sharda and Sarvik Sengupta. Congratulations, guys. Oops. Well, you're in the infra business. So, thank you. <laughs> okay, our next winner has a simple motto. As long as she gets to act, the medium or language doesn't matter. And it's helping her make her mark with popular web shows like Girl in the City and movies like Karva, Chopsticks and Tribhanga under her belt, she has been pushing the envelope with her diverse choice of projects. Please welcome one half of the heart and soul of little things, Mithila Palkar. Congratulations, and uh, thank you very much, Ashish and Brian, for joining us. Okay, now, India's dynamic economy is home to decades-old family businesses, and then there are new age startups. So being a second generation or third or fourth gen entrepreneur is no easy task. You have a strong legacy to preserve and build upon, a family way of working, and transformation of any kind can be very hard. Being a startup founder, on the other hand, means agility, flexibility, innovation, all of those are your mantras. But both have their ups and downs and a plethora of opportunities and challenges. So our upcoming panel will have two startup entrepreneurs and one next generation family business executive compare and contrast their experiences and mistakes that they can and cannot afford to make. And what if they had a do-over? Would the startup founder rather choose to be in a family business or would the second generation leader prefer to go out on their own? Please put your hands together and welcome Kairav Engineer, VP Business Development at Astral, who's a second generation entrepreneur, Ashwin Damera, founder, Eruditis, and Sudhakar Adapa, founder and CEO of Commerceify, to represent first generation founders. I'd also like to invite Nisha Podar, editor MA at CNBC TV 18. Thank you so much, Sumera, and a very good evening to all of you. It's going to be an interesting discussion. What you, would you rather be, a founder or a first um, or a third generation or a second generation family business uh, owner? Well, so let's begin by talking about one of the tenets of any business, which is uh, the hunger, the fire in the belly. Ashwin, would you say that there is a differentiator between a first-gen entrepreneur or a family business businessman when it comes to this particular aspect? My, my experience is a first-generation entrepreneur, so I'll speak for first-generation entrepreneurs. I won't presume to talk about uh, you know, family businesses. Yes. But as a first-generation entrepreneur, everything that you're doing rides on that one company. Right? So, let me give an example. If you're Bavi Shagarwal and you started Ola Electric and your first product catches fire, you may also be Tata Motors with the Nano, which also catches fire. But one of those founders' ass is literally on fire. Because if that company goes down, that's entire legacy, entire hard work. They're investors you depend on. You don't have a conglomerate to draw, draw cash on, etc. So I do believe that you are more hungry, it's riskier. 
it's kind of like an immigrant in a country, right? You have to make it work. Right. But like I said, I speak for first generation entrepreneurs. I can't presume that uh, second generation, third generation are not hungry. But Ashwin, over there, I would say that not many companies, even if family businesses, have a conglomerate kind of structure. They may have just one product as well, and they can also be in a do-die situation as well. Like I said. Right. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, so point taken, but Kerov, tell us about your experience. Uh, a lot of people envy the second and third generation family business owners. But I'm sure it also comes with great expectations. So most people think second generation, third generation entrepreneurs as spoiled brats, like, you know, born in money, um, free to do whatever they want. Um, they don't have anyone to hold them accountable for, but that's not the case. Um, I, I categorize second generation entrepreneurs as there are two types of them. One is you are born into money, uh, You've been raised with people around you, with, you know, servants, maids. You know, you've, you've been born into money. You've been born into a, sort of a legacy. And you have a very different view of your business. Then you have a second generation which basically sees their parents slog it out and sees the ups and downs of their parents as they build their empire. And, you know... I call them generation 1.5 because most of the times they value or the efforts that their parents have put into the business right. and have seen uh, their parents struggle, uh, often uh, have grown up without one of the parents around yes. because they are very busy building their business. Uh, mm. They already have a lot going on in their life. So it's very different, uh, depends on what kind of a second generation you are. Right. I belong to generation 1.5. Okay. okay, I've seen my dad slog it out. Yes. Uh, we were bankrupt in 2002. We got a notice to evacuate our home in uh, on Diwali 2002. Uh, I was 14 years old. So I've seen him slog it out. I've seen him struggle. I've seen him fail. Yes. Um, we got listed in 2007 uh, when I was 20, um, 19 years old. So I've seen the whole journey. Right. And, you know, I value uh, the journey and I share the same hunger right. for growth and I share the same passion for the business as he does. Hmm. All right. So great story there, Karav. Let me also uh, get Sudhakar's view on this. So Sudhakar, uh, you know, a lot of people think that uh, the family business owners have a launch pad already ready, right? But I'm sure that um, there are a lot of good aspects or benefits of having your own freedom when you are a founder of your own company. Well, you know, my size, my shoe size fits me just fine. I don't have uh, a large shoes to fill. You know, if you are a second generation entrepreneur, you have large shoes to fill in all probability. Otherwise, you don't even call it a second generation because the first generation would have failed, right? Yes. So in that sense, it, it weighs slightly on your shoulders. You don't have a legacy to live upon. So you are free to fall get up and then get again running. You don't have legacy issues as you call it. So right. I would say it is what I call a, a founder's freedom. Right. The freedom to experiment, the freedom not being afraid to fail, right. not having to live up to the expectations of people around you. That is, I think, is the advantage of first generation entrepreneur. Hmm. The second generation might have an edge in terms of raising the resources because they have a track record and the, the family is more tuned towards it. Yes. Uh, they have seen, they, have, they were risk takers uh, in that generation, so they've seen the uh, the pros and cons of that, so they would be more aware of it. Unlike a first generation entrepreneur who come from middle right. class backgrounds, uh, you know, where there is an element of scare in 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 the family because no one has ventured into the uh, uh, in, into the woods, right? Right. So risk taking ability that's a very important aspect of any business. Ashwin, jump in on this particular aspect. You think that uh, the risk ability is stunted when you're all alone, you're a lone ranger. Well, I'll speak from personal experience. So I just finished my MBA. I was coming back to India. I was going to start this, uh, my first startup. And my parents, they were, you know, professionals. They were not entrepreneurs, not, not from business per se. They were like, why can't you be like your brother, take up a full-time job, pay off your, you know, student loan? Why have all of this? And in their minds, they were envisaging, you know, yeah. debt collection agents standing outside the front door, knocking on their door, etc. So risk-taking ability, it was, a, it was a lonely, solitary journey. Yes. 
But in some sense, uh, what I had though was the freedom to do what I want. Yes. My first startup was in travel, my second startup was in education. I don't know if I have it in me to do a third one, but it could probably be in some other field. I'm not bound or constrained by preconceived notions um, that my family imposes on me. So like everything in life, but pros and But what cons. about the finances, the entire resources, the infrastructure already ready, and if you have the interest to just build on that? You're asking this at a very good time because just last week, there was a large uh, industrial house that said, Ashwin, we'll give you 2,500 crores, come and build our education business. This is like fifth generation, you know, large, but very large. Uh, the, there's a headline story going, by the way. Uh, I don't yeah. know about that. <laughs> and then I, was, I, was, I came out of the meeting, declined, so there's no headline. Uh, but said, oh my, my God, I wish somebody gave that to me when I started 10 years back. Yeah. But my family was asking me to take a full-time job. Right, I'll uh, have a side chat with you because that same company can be going to another company which is facing a lot of, you know, negative press right now and they may be also ready. You know the name of the company. <laughs> no, no, okay. Uh, so, so, so jokes aside, uh, but kind of um, tell us about uh, one particular aspect which is the sensitivity that goes into the business because you're working with the same family members and uh, then there are emotions and relationships to be maintained when you go back home. Is that a very fine balance and a very tough burden on the youngest member of the family in the business? See, whenever you have multiple family members involved in a business, there's going to be clash of egos. And uh, one needs to understand if there are differences at work. Me and my dad fight all the time. So if there are differences at work, you leave those differences at work and you go back home and then you enjoy time with your family. The day you start bringing your uh, differences at work, you bring them home and then it affects your family life, is when you go back to the drawing board and then you sit with your family council and then you decide where to draw the line, who to allocate what and how to restructure power and you know how to manage the hierarchy of the organization. People who don't, family businesses who don't align that and things change, okay? You have first generation, second, third, fourth, things change. More and more family members keep, uh, you know, joining the business. So this thing needs to be worked upon on a regular basis, every decade or so, so that, you know, your business is uh, functioning smoothly without any sort of, you know, politics or any sort of differences between the, um, you know, promoters. Yeah. Okay, so that's a tough one to really manage. Sudhakar, what are the main challenges apart from the risk and that one decision of venturing all alone as a founder? What has been the toughest and the biggest challenge you think you have faced as a founder? I think the, the, the first and foremost challenge is the mindset. No? Because resources, when, when you are an entrepreneur, no, you know how to hustle and you know how to manage things uh, to be more resourceful as such. But I think the biggest challenge uh, is, is the mindset. Yes. Uh, the atmosphere around you is, is not very conducive for entrepreneurship, you know. Have you ever seen a person in India putting that failed venture in his resume? I don't think so. They say there's a gap or something or, you know, took a, a sabbatical, you cover it up with fancy words and all this stuff, right? So I think the society at large yes. uh, is, is very risk averse and uh, they see these fancy headlines of these unicorns and all this stuff and they say, and they forget the, the, the toil in building the, the company. And mind you, when I started my entrepreneurial journey 18 years back, straight out of IM Calcutta, uh, the ecosystem hasn't really evolved. The venture capital is, is, is much nascent these days. Yes. And remember, in those days, the word businessman and entrepreneur were used synonymously. There is no difference between a businessman and an, as, an entrepreneur as such. So I think that is yeah. the biggest challenge. Everything mm. else can, can be managed. All right, so great you mentioned uh, venture capital. Ashwin, uh, do you think that there is a lack of guidance also uh, for the founders and that already existing legacy mindset and intel which comes in a business house, that really lacks and we have seen the pitfalls of that as well. The lessons have been learned by the uh, startup industry in terms of even diluting uh, their equity at a very early stage in the last wave that we saw. Well, definitely so, uh, but that is also kind of balanced by the scale of ambition, mm. right? I think you may sometimes see in uh, family businesses the 
aversion to dilute, aversion to take external capital, because then now you have not just the family, but a third and a fourth voice at the table. And those dynamics sometimes, I mean, they can be navigated, they tend to be challenged. Yes. I remember a conversation, I was fundraising, it was in Bangalore, a well-known uh, uh, firm. For the first seven years of Eruditus' existence, we were profitable. Then we raised venture capital money, and then we were never been profitable again. Um, that's a joke, guys. You can laugh. Um, <laughs> but the point is, when I met them to raise capital for the first time, which was after seven years, they asked me this question, are you a promoter or an entrepreneur? So I was a little puzzled. I said, what's the difference? They said, no, you built a company. It's gone from zero to about 700, so not 100 crores, zero to 100 crores. It's profitable. You've not raised outside capital. Mm. You're not an entrepreneur, you're a promoter. Mm. And see, that mindset yes. is something that I think has changed significantly. Mm. Um, but there's a lot more work to be done in, in going there. That an entrepreneur somehow has to take money, dilute. Yeah. I mean, take that great example, zero, the et cetera, which I think are breaking that mindset. Yes. Um, all right, not just an equity dilution, good that you raise this difference between entrepreneur and promoter. Uh, do you agree with the view that even though startup founders are new age company founders and fairly young and new in mindset, have also in the past made some mistakes and behaved like very old age promoters as well? Every startup founder has made mistakes. Why only new age and younger? I have made mistakes. Last 12 months, if I look back, there's so many I wish I didn't do. Um, so every startup, everybody in this room, as great as we all may be, have all made mistakes. The difference is how fast you learn and how cheap or costly that mistake is. You know, there was a yeah. famous Stanford professor who said, look, if I have a first-time entrepreneur with a great idea, but I have a failed second-time entrepreneur, 100 times out of 100, I'll invest in the second time entrepreneur. Why? Because they have the wisdom of failure. Failure is a great less teaching, is a great teacher. Yes, uh, and uh, that's another point even Sudhakar and mentioned, the, the ability is, to fail and bounce back. As a first generation yes. entrepreneur, you can learn so much from your failure at somebody else's money. <laughs> a second generation entrepreneur is your own family's money. Oh, that's a free ride. Uh, well, <laughs> so Kerav, uh, this is a very important aspect. You know, you need to have your own learnings with failures. Do you think that the ability to fail is now rest is restricted in family businesses? You're not allowed to have any failure because there are just so many decision makers. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. If that was the case, a lot of family businesses that have gone belly up wouldn't have. Um, see, the thing is that... Uh, it all depends on, on the first generation driving who's driving the business, right? How, how much of a free hand do they give you? As a, that, as a, that was exactly my question. Yeah. So, you know, there are people like my, my father doesn't question, you know, whenever I take a decision or whenever I want to do something new or think about something out of the box. He always supports the idea. Yeah. But then you, ha you know you have uh, uh, a lot of rigid first generation promoters who try, who are scared to fail, okay? And I understand why they are scared to fail because they've built the business and they've invested so much behind it and maybe they might have seen a, s a few small failures growing that business. And you know, it generally makes them scared to lose it all. Yes. And they somehow feel that the next generation, the kids, grandkids are not well equipped to take decisions and you know they, they just can't let it go and when that happens you know you raise a second third generation of promoters who've never taken a decision for themselves and come one day when the first generation promoter passes away or retires or what not yes. and then you have these 40, 50 year old second generation people yes. trying to run a business who don't know what it takes to you know take a decision or to fail Succession or to take a Succession planning and creating the next gen leaders, uh, that could be one of the constraints. But I want to come to an important point here. Uh, as the standards of corporate governance is really getting heightened in India, the investors want to look at it. Even the equity market participants now want to look at it. So it's not just that you want a PE investor that you have to have great corporate governance. Do you think that the scrutiny and the burden to really prove yourself has really gone up in the future generations of family businesses. Yeah, so 
not only your investors, uh, your shareholders or your potential shareholders, but also your employees, uh, your family, the people around you, they're always scrutinizing you and they always see, you know, what is this guy up to? How does he work? What decisions does he make? How does he make them? You know, does he have the same, you know, decision-making abilities that his father has or his mother has? So you always, you know, under scrutiny and it's, it's kind of when you are a second generation promoter, especially in the corporate governance standards of today, you know, you always have so many people you are answerable to and you are always something to prove to everyone around you because it's not just about leading a company anymore. Uh, you know, uh, they're not looking for leaders, they're looking for people who can yes. lead well. Yes. Hmm. Uh, there were leaders in family businesses, uh, but now they're thinking about, you know, is the family business, is the second generation, third generation able to lead well? And that is, is the key thing. All right. So not as rosy a picture when it comes to the next generation in a family business. Um, all right. And uh, so, Ashwin, the final question, freedom versus the infrastructure that is already provided or the launch pad which is easily available. What would you rather choose even today? It's a flawed question because truly if you're born into a family business. You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. And today as a first time entrepreneur, how do I become a second generation family business? So you're dealt a hand. I always believe this is like life. You're dealt a hand. Play to the best of your ability. Uh, well Freedom said. and all is all faltu ka discussion. Hai. What you have, you make the best of it. All right. Well, well said. Uh, Kerav, hand on heart. Uh, if you had the ability and the freedom to have your own business, would you have still chosen that? Yeah, I would, I would do it uh, by myself. If I had an option to, I would start something on my own. Because the ownership feeling that you get when right. you make something you'd never get it as a second generation. Promoter. Freedom over all the infrastructure that is there. Sudhakar has already said that freedom is uh, the choice uh, thing for him. Thank you so much, Ashwin Kerav, as well as uh, Sudhakar for joining us. And thank you so much uh, to the audience for patiently listening in. Thank you. Kairav, Ashwin, Sudhakar, Nisha, thank you very, very much. It's now time to move on to our second set of awards. May I welcome Anil Kaushal, Head of Lupin Life, and Avinash Kaul, CEO Network 18 and MD AETN, to give away the awards. This husband-wife duo has built one of the most valued D2C brands out of India. Building a business on the principle of frugality and finding a niche in the crowded baby care market has been instrumental to their success. Please put your hands together for our next tycoons of tomorrow, the co-founders of Mama Earth, Varun and Ghazal Alag. Congratulations. He is the first member of the fourth generation of the Parikh family to join the family business. And he comes with a mission to make the Neil Kamal, the popular household brand Neil Kamal, sustainable to meet the challenges of a warming planet. Congratulations, Mihir Parikh, Executive Director at Neil Kamal. May I please welcome on stage Mihir Parikh's parents, Hitain Parikh, the Managing Director of Neil Kamal, and Smriti Parikh to accept the award on his behalf. Mihir is currently pursuing an MBA in the US.
congratulations. Now, this new age tycoon is making higher education accessible to millions while creating a valuable business. Ashwin Damera's eruditis is an outlier among Indian edtech biggies that are either stagnating or witnessing degrowth after the pandemic boom. Please welcome with a big round of applause, Ashwin Damera, founder eruditis. Congratulations, Ashwin. Now, Abhinav Astana's Postman brings world-class software products to customers and is putting India on the global tech map. Ushering in the era of API-first software, Astana believes no amount of funding can make up for your lack of understanding of a customer's pain point. Words to live by for all entrepreneurs everywhere. I'd like to invite Monica Gunalan, Head of People Ops, APAC Postman, to accept the award on Abhinav's behalf. Gaurav Kumar is known for successfully creating and running not one, not two, but three startups. His startup, UB, previously known as Cred Avenue, is enabling credit for India's small and medium enterprises that often find it difficult to raise debt. I'd like to request Dhawal Vikramse from UB to accept the award on his behalf. So thank you very much, Anil Avinash. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And here's something that's going to be very interesting, our next discussion. So OTT got a massive push during the pandemic. We've seen new talent and contemporaries break the boundaries of entertainment, creativity, and content to find unparalleled fame. OTT then is the great leveler. Our first panelist to discuss how OTT is redefining entertainment, talent, and stardom is our tycoon of tomorrow, Mithila Palkar. Please do join us on stage, Mithila. Okay, next up, she's played the sweet but conniving Beena in Mirzapur and the shy but sharp rookie cop Neeti Singh in Delhi crying. Please welcome on stage, Rasika Dugal. Okay, and what can I say to introduce our third panelist except Harshad Mehta Padharo? Uh, please welcome Prateek Gandhi. And may I also invite Kunal Purandare, editor desk, Forbes India, to moderate this session. Good actors uh, don't stay hidden for too long. Uh, at the same time, they need the right platform and opportunity to showcase their work to a large number of people. We, we have with us uh, three actors, Prateek Gandhi, Rasika Dugal, and Mithila Palgar, who have done some fabulous work across mediums. But it's the digital space that really shot them into the limelight. 
Before I speak uh, broadly about OTT versus cinema and uh, content, uh, I would like to ask you all about that one performance that has, it, that has had the greatest impact on your careers. I'll start with you, Pratik. Uh, Scam 1992 was undoubtedly the turning point of your career. Your performance was hailed by one and all. Uh, how has life changed uh, after Scam 1992? Uh, and before I ask, before I uh, allow you to answer that, uh, I mean it's it's not been an overnight success. It's I mean you worked for 15 years and uh, had a strong uh, foundation in theatre as well as Gujarati films. So it must not have been easy. Yeah, in fact, uh, so with your first line that you started, that good actors cannot be hid, uh, hidden know, for too hidden long. for too long. So either I was not a good actor earlier <laughs> for 15 years <laughs> before Scam came in my life. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so Scam changed my life uh, downside up. I keep saying that. I have two phases in my life, pre-Scam and post-Scam. <laughs> so Scam changes a lot of lives all across the world and it changed mine for good. And that's the reason that I'm here and having this discussion with you all. <laughs> so uh, it put me on national, international level suddenly. And whatever that I was doing on stage or in regional cinema uh, had a little and a very limited reach. And suddenly, scam came and uh, the whole world noticed me. So even my uh, seven years daughter, she kept asking me that you have been acting since a long time. And why is now that people want to take photograph with you? What is it? What, is, what changed? And I didn't have answer to that. <laughs> The only answer is that I, I scammed them. <laughs> uh, Rasika, um, you've done a lot of work in films, the likes of Kiss Akshay, before you did Mirzapur. But uh, your feisty, bold, fearless portrayal of Bina Tripathi uh, in the crime thriller took everyone by surprise because it's completely opposite of what you are. Uh, do you believe that the role uh, did a lot more for your career than any of your other work? It did and it uh, never ceases to surprise me the kind of following that uh, the show has. I'm still sort of taken aback by the kind of manic following that Mirzapur has. Uh, it completely uh, uh, was a new experience for me and I'm afraid that I'm getting addicted to it. Um, but, uh, uh, but before that, like you said, I'd done many independent films and films that I was very proud of, films that were uh, made with a lot of passion and love and uh, with, uh, with with really preserving everybody's creativity during the process of filming. Uh, and uh, a, a film like, uh, uh, the film that I'm talking about is Kissa. And that film had only released only in two theatres in 2015 in Bombay. Uh, and that was very disappointing to me. And I remember the pre-Mirzapur days, I used to walk around, whenever I would go for a meeting, uh, I would carry a DVD of Kissa with me and say, you know, please watch my little <laughs> indie film. And uh, yeah, so that was the kind of experiences that I was having before Mirzapur. I had never had access to the kind of audience that that show has. So yes, it, that changed many things for me. Mithila, you're literally um, uh, a new age star born on the internet. Uh, internet was very new when you started. Uh, the cup song that you did of the Marathi uh, hit, He uh, Chale Turu Turu, uh, became a rage. I mean, it has over 7 million views now. And plus, yeah. <laughs> Plus, uh, you have the popular little things, uh, uh, which is being spoken about even today. Uh, do you believe, which of these two uh, do you think made a difference to your career and uh, sort of helped you gain that acceptance, not only from the audience, but also from your fraternity? Uh, I would uh, definitely want to say the cup song first and little things next, because the cup song, I think, put me on the map. Uh, Fortunately or unfortunately, as a singer and a YouTuber, and I was happy to just be known by people at that point in time. And of course, little things, even today, we we finished the show, like we, we had our finale show season last year, release last year. But it still continues to be something that has reached across the globe. And it is all thanks to the internet. So yeah, I think I was born here. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know any better. <laughs> Rasika, when you were studying at FTII, you did an acting, a diploma in acting. You said that you were surprised to know that people came there to become stars. Uh, of course, the time was different. 
but do you think OTT has changed the definition of stardom? Uh, it definitely has given opportunity for uh, more people to uh, be, be, be called stars, if I may say so. And, uh, it's not that, uh, and it still, still, I think, uh, remains a democratic uh, setup where every month there is a new star, a new star is born, you know. It's not that there are these eight people who got these four shows uh, five years back and they're the ones who keep getting, the, uh, getting work again and again. Every month there's a new show, there are new actors, there are new stars, so to say. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's made uh, a lot of things more democratic than it used to be. And I'm very grateful for that. I keep worrying that that's going to change. And uh, everybody keeps whispering and murmuring that that's changing every month. But so far it hasn't. Uh, Pratik, you said your uh, stint in theatre helped you understand the grammar of acting and you still go back to theatre. You did a play recently. You have an OTT release, uh, a film uh, which released recently as well. Uh, you said it took time for mainstream acceptance but you wouldn't have it in any other way because that was a learning curve of sorts. Now you're in a position where uh, you can say no to a lot of things uh, citing, you know, you're flooded with offers. <laughs> so much has changed in all these years. Uh, what is the difference that you see in the industry? That's the biggest difference uh, with OTT coming in is that it uh, broke the so-called equation or the standard formula. Because I always believed that we uh, as entertainers, as actors, as creators are in a business of experiments. So normally formulas are derived after the experiment is success. If it is not a successful experiment, you don't derive formula out of it. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, in a business of experiment, how can you go by formula is the constant question that I, I would discuss with all my colleagues also. The theatre gave me that freedom uh, for the longest years in my life. Because we would experiment with all the different subjects and different, uh, uh, different setups also. So, the kind of theatre that I kept doing for almost 15 years were, was always called uh, experimental theatre. And in fact, mainstream theatre, people never considered it as theatre also. So that already prepared me for these kind of uh, rejections in mainstream. Uh, and with OTT, because it broke the barrier of a set formula or a set kind of a format, it gave birth to different kind of storytelling. Right. And I have always believed that there was always an audience. It is just that we could never reach to that audience. Now with OTT and internet, we are reaching out to those people, those who like to watch these kind of stuff. So uh, it's a win-win situation, even for the audience, for the makers, for actors, everyone. Uh, Mithila, you've been language and medium agnostic. Uh, <laughs> uh, is that the advantage that an actor today has? I mean, you don't really need to restrict yourself to one particular medium to grow or to show uh, your talent or your work? 100%, 100%. And in fact, I'm... I, every time I do something new, I'm hungrier for more. I just recently did a Telugu film and I'm like, okay, great. Now I want to do a Tamil film, a Malayalam film. And the fact that um, uh, these platforms are as accessible as they are, to add to what both of them said is so right. Like Pratik said that um, I think uh, we are not telling stories of heroes and heroines anymore. We are telling stories about people, which makes a lot, a lot of actors like us get the opportunities that we are getting today and uh, so yeah definitely I mean I think it's a, a the internet is an accessible platform which makes it easy to reach also as far as you do when you're on the internet and uh, access as many things as you can. So you said it's not about heroes and heroines anymore it's about people uh, which is why I think unlike movies where you need a star to justify a budget or maybe uh, that's the excuse they use to sign a big uh, name, you know, because you need an opening. Uh, is that uh, the reason why now uh, the casting on OTT is defined more by the script rather than anything else? Do you agree? Uh, you all can take turns and answer. Yeah. So I, I feel that uh, with OTT what is happening is that first the definition of hero is changed. The one who is taking the story forward becomes a hero and there are like uh, in the professional world that we keep hearing situational leadership. Uh, in the long formats, we see those situational uh, heroes. In first two, three uh, episodes of a series, there is one person who is leading the story forward so he becomes hero and suddenly he dies. So a new hero comes in and then he takes the story forward. Uh, apart from that, it doesn't have a pressure to perform in first three days. 
once it releases. Because mostly on first three days, the people who go and watch the film, they are going on the anticipation. And that anticipation comes from the faces involved, from the names involved, and maybe some subject line which comes across to you as an audience from the trailer, which excites you. After that first three days, what comes out is the real word of mouth. And that's when the turnout is seen. So that's the real test of the film or a product. Whereas in OTT, right from the first day, it is given to thousands of people at the same time. And they can watch it on their, uh, th their convenient time, but there is no pressure to perform on first three days. So that is also opening up a lot of doors for the experiments. Would you all want to chip in? I agree with him 100%. I feel like that is my favorite part about being on, uh, on the OTT. I didn't realize that until like I did a film in between. I was like, oh my God, everybody's worrying about how much it's going to make and how much, uh, how many people are going to actually go watch the film and going to buy the tickets. When you're on the internet, it's just, it's out there. And then it's just there to be accessed by people at their convenience. Rasika? I think good content was always around. And uh, uh, it's just that distribution was always a bottleneck. Uh, uh, so even the independent films, that I had done earlier, there were enough people who were producing uh, smaller content-driven films at that time because the cost of production uh, had gone down significantly. Things had gone from film to digital. So people were able to make a film even if they didn't have massive budgets. A film like Bheja Fry had done very well. Uh, so there was incentive for other people to sort of experiment with the one crore film at that time. So there were a lot of small production houses that came up and made some very interesting content, but the bottleneck always remained distribution. I think the distribution networks were still sort of uh, risk averse and they, were, they would always say, Ki, nahi, uh, no, but we don't have an audience for such kind of content. But the OTT has broken that myth and therefore I think the content was always around. It's just that the success of good content uh, uh, on OTT platforms is proof of the fact that the audiences were always versatile and ready for a lot. It's just that we were not being able to reach them. Yeah, prior to the filming of Manto, uh, you said you were almost about to sign some five films and uh, the producers uh, said you weren't saleable enough and you missed out on those films. Uh, of course, that won't be happening right now. I think OTT is giving that kind of uh, uh, an opportunity for raw and untapped talent, don't you think? Yeah, I. I think that, I believe that, and I have even I experienced it. So with my first film, Bhavai, which got released after COVID, uh, after Scam, it was shot before Scam. And in fact, while shooting for that film, I was approached for Scam, and I auditioned, and I got selected. So that was my first Hindi film as, as a central protagonist. Uh, he was finding it too difficult to sell the film. And while, we were, while he uh, you know, asked me to do the film, my first question to him is that I am more than willing to do the film, but you first check whether you want to do this with me or no, because I understand it will be difficult for you to sell the film. And that's what happened after the film. So he could not release the film for two years after making a film. After Scam came, suddenly things uh, <laughs> changed. Uh, it was a different perspective. And then he could release the film. So this is a regular phenomenon. Uh, Nawazuddin Siddiqui had said in one of his interviews that, you know, OTT platforms are becoming a dumping ground now. It's just about quantity over quality. Do you think quality is going to suffer with so many OTT platforms coming up? And I don't know if it's because of the number of OTT platforms coming up. It's just that sometimes quality does suffer when uh, uh, you're asked to churn out content too quickly. I mean, we've seen that with subsequent seasons, for example, and I always try as much as I can to control that in the ones that I work with, that we kind of maintain the integrity of, of the first season uh, creatively, at least. And that is always the attempt. But yes, he's right. There's the good and bad here also. It's not like everything coming uh, on the OTT space is, uh, is good. There's a lot of mediocre stuff. But there seems to be room for everything. You know, there seems to be an audience for everything. There seems to be uh, people who there seem to be people who can uh, create different kinds of things, and that's what that's what's exciting to me about this space. Uh, the pandemic 
uh, accelerated certain things when it came to OTT. Uh, obviously, the viewing patterns changed. Mithila, do you think it will remain the same even now? Because uh, the thing was that when theatres will reopen, everyone will go back to the theatres. But we've seen this year has not been that great for the movies. So many of them haven't done well. Do you see any shift in uh, viewing patterns um, in today's world? Uh, you know, the thing is that there is an audience for everything and we all want to go to the movies and watch the movies in, on the big screen as well. In fact, I feel like, um, you know, yeah, okay, it's becoming easier to access. A lot of people are like, okay, it will come on the OTT and we'll watch it then. But I watched a film recently called Sita Ramam uh, and I couldn't catch it in the theatre. It's not because I was lazy to go. I just, by the time I came back, it wasn't in the theatre. Uh, and then I said, no, I want to watch this film and I watched it and I felt bad about having watched it on my television screen. So there are films that are meant for the bigger screen and there are things that are meant to like, that are, that are quick bites or uh, that are better seen or watched or enjoyed on the internet on a smaller, in a smaller space. Um, so I feel like it is a, it's an ecosystem and it will balance itself out. I don't think it will be that lopsided anymore now that the world has opened up. Pratik, when you were trying to break through, you said, uh, you know, you found yourself a misfit as far as television was concerned because you saw all those fair-skinned people with bulging biceps over there and you thought, you know, this is not for me. But obviously things have changed so much and uh, you're, you have arrived, I mean, really. And it's not just about you, but all of you. Do you all believe you all have arrived and what's the plan ahead? Yeah, so I mean, the more I, I'm being asked this question, I feel that, that I have arrived. <laughs> because earlier never nobody asked me. But uh, the feeling of arrived comes when the makers are excited to work with you, when you are in the brains of the writers, when uh, the director is visualizing you with the script. So that's the best place for an actor to be in. And that's when you feel confident that now I, I'm not under the pressure to perform. I can go beyond and explore the character, e even in the deeper sense. So that is a very comfortable position. Rasika and Mithila? I start believing I've arrived and then one rejection happens and... <laughs> I'm like, yeah. That keeps you grounded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the world. <laughs> Mithila? I guess. I just, I don't think of it as that really because I feel like the, um, I think we were all ri ri riding the wave of the internet revolution as it was rising. So I have just been going with the flow. So I don't, I have not asked myself this question of have I arrived? Maybe I have. <laughs> That's a mark of somebody who has arrived. Who doesn't ask that <laughs> question. <laughs> I've been enjoying what it is, what, what the internet has to offer, what the entertainment industry today has to offer and like we've all been saying, the narratives have changed, the stories have become different, it's not, um, the definitions have changed, so it's just a very exciting time to be part of the entertainment industry in my opinion. Well, all of you all are known as good actors, fabulous actors, so I think you all can safely say that you all have arrived. Thank you so much. This has been a, an absolutely enriching and insightful conversation. We could go on and on, but unfortunately, we don't have time. Thank you so much once again Thank for your you time. So we wish you Thank all the you. best. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Rasika, Pratik, Kunal, Mithila. Thank you very, very much. May I please invite back on stage Avinash Kaul along with Commercify Sudhakar Adapa to present the next Tycoons of Tomorrow Award followed by the Forbes India Icon of Excellence Recognitions. Okay, from hearables to wearables, this duo has built India's biggest homegrown consumer electronics brand. Their boat is smooth sailing. No points for guessing. Our next tycoons, Aman Gupta and Samir Mehta, the co-founders of Boat. May I please invite on stage Samir Mehta to accept the award for this formidable co-founder duo. Congratulations. 
And now let's get in the icons of excellence. She's resilient, consistent, and a personification of the icon of excellence, Rasika Dogal. And for straddling theater, cinema, and OTT, Prateek Gandhi. Congratulations. Uh, Sudhakar Avinash, thank you very much for doing the honors. And that brings us to the end of the second edition of Tycoons of Tomorrow, presented by Neom and powered by Reliance Industries. I'd like to thank Neom, Reliance Industries, driving partner, Volkswagen India, banking partner, HSBC, health partner, B1, associate partner, Commerceify in association with CNBC TV 18. And a big thank you to all of you, our wonderful audience, for being here with us. And congratulations once again to all the winners. But before we let you go, if I can request all the winners to please once again join us on stage for a group photo. I, if I can request all the winners to please join us on stage. Do you want to run and get it? Uh, can we also have uh, the representatives here from Neom, Reliance Industries, Volkswagen India, HSBC, B1, and uh, Commerceify to please join us on stage. Everyone's taking pictures, so we have no one clapping, but don't worry. We're all very happy. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. That's all from us at Forbes India. And most importantly, the bar is now open. Good night and see you again soon.
Forbes India, Tycoons of Tomorrow, presented by Neon.